Hi, everybody. Welcome to Live Spirit Chat. Live Spirit Chat is a chance for you to participate in a live group free teaching session and get your questions answered about developing your spiritual practice, your spiritual path, your spiritual connection, and all kinds of things related and in between, such as practicing magic, folk magic, tarot, divination, working with your spirit guides, your ancestors, so on and so forth. Live Spirit Chat happens almost every Saturday at 12 noon United States Central Standard Time. It happens in a new private location, which is much more intimate and allows you the option to interact with me one on one and allows you the option to submit your questions anonymously. So if you would like to sign up to receive the invitation to participate in the live spirit chat in a private location, there is a sign up link underneath the video. If you're watching this on YouTube. Live Spirit Chat is always archived on YouTube, so you can always find the archives there as well. So for Live Spirit Chats, I am going to answer some questions. I do offer the option to submit early bird questions. I take those through Instagram. And then after that, I go ahead and take the live questions that are here with me. First, I wanna give you some announcements. So I'm hosting a tarot party later on today at 4 p.m. United States Central Standard Time. This is to celebrate our three-year anniversary of Mystic Membership via Patreon. The tarot party is a chance for me to give some gratitude back to my patrons, my Mystic members, to offer some readings, to offer some guidance, to offer some insight, and to hang out and have fun together. So 4 p.m., y'all, if you are a Mystic member, Everybody is invited, all levels of Mystic membership. Also, I'm hosting a giveaway on Instagram right now. So if you haven't checked that out, go ahead and pop over to the Instagram page. It is a giveaway of a love spell kit. We are in Venus retrograde. So if you wanna talk a little bit about how to best enhance your love magic in accordance with Venus retrograde, we can discuss that as well. But all you have to do to enter the contest and win the spell kit is comment with a joke that makes me laugh. And then the winner is going to be selected tomorrow on Sunday, the 24th. The next announcement that I have is that Brooke from Nightbird, Nightbird Tarot is going to be co-hosting an Instagram live with me. We're going to do live spirit chat together and we're going to do it on Instagram. So we're going to do it live publicly and that's in two weeks. So I won't be hosting a live chat on the 30th or the weekend of the 30th. But then that first weekend in June, Brooke and I will be hosting a live spirit chat together. That's going to be fun. We're gonna offer some special things. We're gonna offer some guidance and insight and we're gonna have fun together. I'm really looking forward to that. So mark your calendars for that. If you're a Mystic member at the Empress level or above, we are plugging through this grief workshop. We are going to get this finished within the next couple of weeks. If you are doing that grief workshop with me, go ahead and schedule your next one-on-one -on -one partners meeting with me now. Let's get through the rest of this grief work. Let's put in the hard work and get through it within the next couple of weeks and then move on to new courses and workshops to be announced soon. Now I'm gonna go ahead and address these early bird questions and then move on to your live questions. So, Ah, the first thing is a question that I have for you. Maybe this term is related to old school folk magic. I'm not sure, but somebody asked me about something and I don't quite know what it is. I don't know everything, right? So if someone out there knows what this is and you know, this would be a great opportunity for me to learn. Their question is, I would love to know what's your favorite Greer and why? Greer is spelled G-R-I-E-R, -E Greer. Now this could be a typo or this could be something uh, related to magic or spirituality that I'm not familiar with yet. So feel free to comment or engage in discussion with me. If you know something about this, I would love to learn. Okay, and then the first question that I can address is, 
easy way to decipher the voices that speak to you. So she is talking about her clear audience. And that's something that I love talking about. Clear audience is pretty strong with me. So this is a gift that I'm really familiar with. And it's one that I love talking about. It's one that I find really fascinating to develop as well. It's a trickier, it's, it's one of the trickier clairs. It's one of the trickier psychic connections. And the reason why is because clairaudient people are very prone to being highly analytical people. This is a characteristic that commonly goes along with clairaudient people. So because you're an analytical person and you easily tap into your logical mind as well as that clear audience. It's easy to talk yourself out of your clear audience, especially because clear audience most often comes to you as a voice in your head, right? So it's easy for you to talk yourself out of it, to overanalyze it, and to say uh, that it's just your thoughts, right? And that it doesn't mean anything. So there are a few ways that you can begin to really hone in on when you're experiencing clear audience as opposed to when you're experiencing your other types of thoughts. And the first thing that I'm going to say that I say often, but I never get tired of saying is that it's important to practice some kind of mindfulness. So in this context, when we're talking about mindfulness, we're talking about just paying more attention to your thoughts paying attention to how your thoughts work for you, to how your thoughts sound in your mind. And just, you know, whenever you, you think of it, remind yourself to just kind of tune into your thoughts and listen, see what's going on there. When you start to really pay attention, we have several layers of thoughts that are going on at all times. I can usually decipher about three layers of thoughts that are going on in my mind uh, at any given time. And I think this is true for most people. So when you start to notice like what types of thoughts these are and, and where they are coming from and we're taught that psychic abilities are going to always be these very loud, dramatic, in-your-face things. Well, the truth is we all have intuition, and intuition is most strongly linked to clear audience and clear sentience, um, clear hearing and clear feeling. And all of us have those gifts to some extent, right? So most of us, let's say most of us, because some people are completely detached from it or some people don't believe in it. And if you don't believe in it, then you're not gonna have it, right? If you don't believe in it, then it isn't working for you. But anyway, um, in order to, to get in touch with this, we need to pay attention to our thoughts. And when we start to pay attention to our thoughts, we notice that our clairaudient thoughts can sometimes be like a little whisper behind our other thoughts, right? It's something that can be going on um, quite frequently or um, quite commonly throughout our daily lives that we just don't notice. And that's kind of how our intuition is. It's these quieter things that are going on within us that we've been kind of um, trained to be detached from or um, distracted from because we're being bombarded with things in our physical life all the time. Um, we, we have to use our senses of survival in order to make it through our physical life. So we're often diverting our senses and diverting our attention to other areas, right? So the first thing we need to do is pay attention to these senses. The second thing is when you start to pay attention, you want to remind yourself every time you feel that you have sensed something intuitively, try to stop and tune into that and pay attention to how you sensed it. So we're specifically talking about clear audience here. So you want to pay attention to how that thought came through. What does the thought feel like? Yes, thoughts have a feeling. Um, what did the thought feel like? What did the thought sound like? Where did it feel like the thought was coming from? I can tell you from my personal experience, my clairaudient thoughts seem to come from 
the back left side of my head, whereas my everyday thoughts are kind of more center or sometimes more on the right side. Also, my everyday thoughts have a different kind of tone. The voice is different. The voice has a different texture. It has a different volume. My clairaudient thoughts are kind of, um, they're not necessarily quieter, but the tone is kind of softer. It's just kind of something that comes through um, in the background. If I'm not paying attention to it, then it seems like it's in the background. So your clairaudient thoughts are going to feel different to you. They're going to sound different to you, and they're going to come through in different areas of your mind. They're going to feel that they're coming through different places in your mind. I'm just gonna look at her question one more time to see if I missed anything. It seems like because she's asking about voices, plural, that she may be talking about connecting with her spirit guides or her ancestors through her clear audience as well. And the thing about that is that you really have to get to know the voices of your ancestors or your guides. Like you have to get to know their personalities. You have to get to know their communication style, right? So this is something that takes time. It's like getting to know a friend. You have to get to know um, how they think, how they feel, how they communicate. And over time, after consistent communication with them, you'll be able to recognize that. Now, the other thing about Claire Audience is that I talked about how it can be something that's just kind of subtle, ongoing in the back of your mind um, all the time, consistently on a daily basis. But there's also another phenomena with Claire Audience where sometimes um, when you're especially connected or when you need certain guidance or when something is more urgent or when a guide is really speaking to you loudly, then you will have those sort of um, big downloads that are very apparent. And interestingly enough, that is when clairaudient people tend to question themselves the most because something will come through so clear. It will be startling. It will be like a thought that doesn't feel like or sound like your thoughts, right? It'll be um, a message or a piece of guidance in your mind that doesn't sound like or feel like your thoughts. And it will startle you if you're not used to it, if you're not paying attention to it. And then that's when your inner critic or your defense mechanisms will kick in and say, well, this can't possibly be psychic abilities. I'm probably just making things up. Or is this because I was thinking about this other thing? Well, one of the ways that you can tell that it is clear audience is that it will be something that you weren't thinking of, something that you wouldn't think of. It will be an approach or a perspective that you are not thinking about and, and something that maybe you wouldn't even think about, something that's kind of out of characteristic for you or from a different per perspective than what you have. It will be guidance that you wouldn't be able to give yourself or information that you wouldn't be able to give yourself. Now that's where clear audience can kind of become intertwined with clear, um, clear cognizance as well, clear knowing, because clear knowing happens like that too. But I hope this gives you some information about ways to decipher your clear audience. And if anything else comes up for me that I should communicate about that, I will let you know. And I only have one more early bird question to address today. So for those of you who have joined me live in today's session, I'm so happy to have you here. And if you have any questions, you can go ahead and submit them now. And when I'm done with this next question, I can start taking your live questions. The next question is, how do I know if my Grigri bag is still alive? And thank you for this question. I like this question. How do I know if my Grigri bag is still alive? So let's go over a few ways to interact with your mojo bag or your Grigri bag. And the first thing is, if you are someone who can sense energy, 
you should be able to sense if that bag is alive or not. You should be able to sense if it is active or not. And even if you don't sense energy, let's go through a small practice right now, an exercise to assist you with sensing energy. So traditionally, most people would say your left hand is your receptive hand and your right hand is your giving hand. And this is something that we use in magic to either receive or project energy when we're raising energy or directing energy through our bodies. Now, I would add that it really depends on which hand is your dominant hand. So if you're left-handed, then your right hand is going to be your receptive hand. So the exercise is take your receptive hand and hold the grigri bag in that hand. I always have this grounding rock when I talk. It helps me stay on topic. It helps me stay grounded when I speak to you. So hold your grigri bag in your receptive hand and just sense its energy. And if at first you don't feel the energy strongly, then you may want to practice a little bit with sensing energy. And the way that you would practice sensing energy is by taking a variety of objects with different types of energies, such as a rock, a crystal, a plant, a grigri bag, a root, so forth and tune in and hold them in your receptive hands and just practice on allowing yourself to receive their energy or their feeling or their vibration. Practice allowing yourself to be open to and receive the vibrations that they are omitting. We're all made up of energy. We're all made up of vibrations, right? So. You can sense the vibration or the energy of anything and any object if you allow yourself to receive it, if you allow yourself to tune into it. If this isn't something that comes super naturally to you, then you may need a little bit of practice and practicing with those different objects is going to assist you with learning what different things feel like and learning when something feels very vibrant and alive and when something doesn't. Um, if you had two Grigri bags that you could compare, that may be very helpful as well, especially if one of them is new and you know that it's very potent, very powerful, and one of them is older, you can compare those to see what the differences are. If this is something that isn't like a, a first sense of yours, if clear sentience or clear feeling isn't something that comes especially naturally to you, you may want to do some kind of short meditation first in order to center yourself and in order to get into the space where you your senses are more heightened, where your perceptions are more heightened so that you can feel those energies. So that's one way. There are other things that you can look for as well. Um, if clairvoyance is something that is stronger for you, then you should be able to look at it and kind of sense the energy surrounding it. You know, if, it's, if it looks dull, if it feels dull, um, if you compare it to something that you know is very lively, very alive, very energetic, like put it next to a flourishing plant and kind of tune into visually, tune into the energy of the plant, look at the energy surrounding the plant, and then look at the energy surrounding the grigri bag, right? So what I'm saying here is use the psychic senses that work the best for you and sense the energy of the grigri bag. Now, if you have been working very closely with this mojo over time, um, feeding it and you know keeping it alive, keeping it charged, keeping it fed, um, you may be able to speak with it as well. So you can hold it in your receptive hand and you can ask it, um, are you still living? Are you still working? Do you need to be fed? Is there anything that you need from me? And you will just sit quietly to receive those answers. And when you engage in this kind of intuitive or spiritual communication with something, 
um, the way that the answer comes to you is not necessarily going to be clear audience, which is like we were discussing earlier, a voice in your head or a voice outside of you. It's going to depend on how your gifts work. So the answer could come to you in a feeling in your body. The answer could come to you in a vision in your mind. The answer could come to you through a sudden realization or a sudden knowing, such as with clear cognizance, right? So there's a variety of ways. Another um, method that you could use would be your reading. If you're adept at readings or even if you're just learning um, to row or to work with a pendulum or something of that nature, you could do a quick reading. All you need is a yes or no, right? So a pendulum would be great for that. Playing cards would be great for that. If you wanted something a little bit more in depth, you could use the tarot to get some guidance about what's going on with the spirit of your mojo. What does it need right now? Is it still alive? I mean, chances are if it's dead, it's gonna feel dull, it's gonna look dull, it's gonna smell dull. You're gonna hold it in your hands and you're gonna know that it's not working anymore. Use Use your intuition to tune into the spirit of that bag and you're going to know if it's time to put it to rest because they do have a shelf life. Like they are um, mortal, so to speak. It's a living spirit. It doesn't live forever, just like we don't live forever. So it is normal for them to die eventually. And at that time, you can bury it. You can bury it or you can give it as an offering, right? So let me know if you have any questions about the Grigri bag. I'm happy to further look into that or further address that in any way that I can. You all can also let me know if you have any other questions about the Claire audience. Any follow-up questions, I'm happy to dig into that a little bit deeper. And I'm interested to see if anyone knows what a Greer is. I just have this feeling that it might be related to old school folk magic and it's something that I just haven't delved into yet. So that would be interesting to know about. All right, so I'm ready to start taking your live questions if anybody has any. I'm gonna take a couple of sips of my delicious beverage and see if you submit some questions. And it looks like maybe we don't have any additional questions today. So I think that we had a nice chat about Claire audience and about working with our mojo bags and about tuning into our spiritual connections and our psychic abilities. I thank all of you for being here. And I look forward to seeing those of you who are Mystic members at 4 p.m. today. And I look forward to seeing the rest of you at 12 noon United States Central Standard Time on the first Saturday of June, live on Instagram, where I will be hanging out with Brooke from Nightbird Tarot. Hold on, someone says they have another question. Okay, I'm ready. <laughs> I'll stay on for just another moment to answer this other question. She's gonna copy and paste it. I have been reading my Blooms Farmers and Planters Almanac for 2020. You know, for years and years, I used to use these heavily specialized moon calendars that um, were just coming from a different perspective, right? And I have found in recent years that I really prefer the far Farmer's Almanacs. And I really like this one. I like Bloom's Farmer's and Planter's Almanac. This is a great way to keep track of the moon cycles. This is a great way to, take, to keep track of the planting cycles, to keep track of your biodynamic farming. That's a term that not everybody uses. That's a modern term that has been applied to an old tradition. So pagans and witches and folk magicians, people who live in cycle with, in harmony with the cycles of nature, 
they have been using this style of farming, of interacting with plants, of growing and harvesting plants for time immemorial. And in modern days, we hear this term applied to such things as uh, natural farming, right? Like food farming, grape farming for wines, etc. biodynamic. But um, planting and harvesting with the moon cycles is something that magical practitioners have always done. And I love these farmers' almanacs for keeping track of these kinds of patterns and for their wealth of information, I highly recommend Blooms. She's saying, so this is about the mojo bag or the grigri that we were just talking about. I just need to check the energy, question mark. And would it come back to life if I changed some ingredients, question mark. Second question, can you talk some more about the grounding rock? I have a friend who might need one. Yeah, so, The thing with the Grigri bag is that if it's dead, it's not going to come back to life, right? They have a life, just like we have a life. Like, we don't come back to life after we're dead. We might be reincarnated, but that's a different story. Um, the Grigri bags, once they're dead, they're dead. It's not going to come back to life. But you could, it could just have weakened energy because it needs to be fed or because it needs to be livened up. That's a different story. Then you could revitalize it. You can liven it up by feeding it, right? Um, so those are kind of two different things. And yeah, you need to check the energy. That's the way that I, that's, yeah, you need to check the energy. That's what magic is all about. So um, your question is, I just need to check the energy, question mark. Yeah, but it's not just, like, it's not something that's so, um, it's not something that's simplistic, even though it may sound simplistic. This, the mojo bag, it is a spirit in and of itself. Those ingredients work together to create one living en entity, one spirit that is then working on your behalf, working in harmony with you. That's why it needs to be fed, because it's a spirit. So, um, interacting with that spirit it's all about interacting with energy just like the rest just like all of magic is right so the real question here is like how you communicate with energy or how you interact with energy or how you as an individual sense energy like how were you interacting with this spirit in the first place what was your relationship like with this spirit um, how were you communicating with it or speaking with it or feeding it? What was your interaction like? Whatever you were using before, whatever methods of interacting with that energy you were using before that was working for you, now you need to go back to that in order to check in with that spirit. This is like a wellness check for the spirit of your mojo bag. Um, you know, find out what it needs or if it's still living or not. Um, so that's why I went into so much detail about all the different ways that you can uh, communicate with that energy or sense that energy or tune into that energy um, because it's really all about your connection, how you communicate with energy, how you receive energy, how you perceive energy, and so forth. Someone is asking me if my earrings are a bone of my spirit animal. No, um, these are chicken bones. <laughs> these are made by a, a witch who used to be local. I wish I could remember her business name right now because I would give her a shout out, but she used to be local and she lives in Arizona now and she was a taxidermist. So she would collect the bones and the animals in the woods and in nature um, very sustainably and then use some of the bones to make jewelry as well as the taxidermy that she performed or that she, um, that she did. And she was a member of the Austin Witches Circle. So I met her at the Austin Witches Markets. Actually, I worked with her in a restaurant first and then I met her at the Austin Witches Markets. Um, and she gave me these earrings. If I remember the name, I think that her business name is Swan Milk. 
S W A N M I L K, Swan Milk. And she is on Instagram. She is in Arizona and she makes amazing jewelry. But I do not believe that she makes much bone jewelry anymore because she moved on to metal casting. These are wire wrapped. The wire is just wrapped around the outside of the bone and now she does metal casting. Okay, so can I talk a little bit more about the grounding rock because they have a friend who might need a grounding rock. Yeah, so I don't have that much to say about it, but this is a rock that I found um, when I was swimming in Lake Michigan. So I found this on the, on the bottom of the lake um, underneath the water. And it has some crystals in it, so you probably can't see it very well on camera. I, I can get it to freckle a little bit for you in the light, but on a hot summer day at the bottom of the water, it stood out to me because it was sparkling. Um, it's very smooth. It, it was actually, you know, in the water probably for a very, very long time. So it's very smoothed down by erosion. And this is like one of those examples of how I just kind of go with my intuition. That is how I do things. That's how I've done things for a long time. And it's, it's even more so how I do things now. And the only difference between me in the past and me now is that now I'm very vocal about the way that I do things, right? So um, I just had the intuition to grab the rock. I've had it with me for a long time. And one day I was doing a reading and I started to feel like I was ungrounded. This is when I was, I had just started doing um, a large quantity of professional readings. I wasn't used to doing that many professional readings at once. I worked for a very well-known, very busy psychic network and I would do like 20 readings in a day. Um, I would do a lot of readings. Sometimes these readings were like five minutes long and I would do like 10 back to back. So I was doing a lot more readings a lot more quickly than what I was used to. One day I was reading and I just started to feel like I wasn't very grounded and very intuitively um, without thinking about it at all, I picked up this rock and I started pressing it to my third eye. <clears throat> And do this sometime with a rock and see how it feels to you. Because for me, it immediately centers me. And I can tell you specifically in my body, the shift that I feel. So what I feel right now is my energy coming down. It's my energy coming down from my crown and kind of traveling down my spine into my lower back and sort of rooting me, grounding me in my root chakra at the bottom of my spine. And it's something that does, it's a shift that just happens very naturally, very smoothly, very quickly by just kind of pausing for a minute, taking a breath and pressing this rock to my third eye. That is something that happens completely spontaneously, completely intuitively. Um, it's just something that I did. And then after that, I would always keep this reading with this rock with me when I performed my readings. And from time to time, I would press it to my third eye if I felt that I needed to be grounded, if I needed to be centered, if I was getting too much up here, you know, um, not focusing and so forth. Um, <clears throat> or getting too much in the spirit realm, too much um interacting with the spirit realm up here rather than the reading or the client down here, right? So I kept it with me always when I was doing my readings and I don't typically press it to my eye anymore. This kind of evolved into a different sort of thing where I usually just hold it in my left hand when I'm speaking. And it just kind of helps me stay grounded, helps me stay focused, helps me stay clear, um, and so forth. And if I get into a situation where I'm speaking, sometimes when I'm speaking, I start to channel or I start to kind of um, like parts of my consciousness start to attend to 
other things, start to attend to my connection to the spirit realm or my connection to the unseen world, right? Like parts of myself will be off over here interacting with, with these things, interacting with these other beings or receiving messages or whatever the case may be. So when I start to notice something like that happening, I just remind myself that I have my grounding rock. I just squeeze it. I just hold onto it and it kind of brings me back down to center. It keeps me focused. So that's a little bit about the grounding rock. Really not that much to say about it, but just a tool that has become um, very useful for me. I keep this with my tarot cards. I keep it stacked on top of my ghetto tarot. Um, and that's just kind of a reminder to me to stay grounded in my readings, to stay grounded when I'm speaking, so on and so forth. If you have follow-up questions about those things, I'm happy to, to um, follow up with them. If I'm speaking during a live spirit chat, like this happens a lot during live spirit chats or doing during videos or during Instagram lives, I will sometimes start channeling. And when that happens, it's just a very um, natural thing that I'm not, a, there's a shift that occurs that I'm not totally aware of when it happens. I Sometimes I become aware of it like in the middle of speaking. <laughs> But I'm not aware of it when the shift happens and I'll just kind of be like messages will just start to to come out of the topic that I'm speaking about to where it's um it's a much deeper message. It's something that I'm not consciously talk like thinking about when when that happens when I start to channel spontaneously it's not something that I'm consciously thinking about it's information that just starts to come through me that I'm that I'm just allowing to flow through me and a lot of times people say that was a message for me and a lot of times no one says anything but what happens is I become aware of the channeling kind of in the middle of it and when that happens, it isn't until I become aware of it that I have to like ground myself. I have to bring myself back down to center so that I can then tie the information together or you know, start, start having a conversation again or so that I don't go off too far into channeling or go off too far into spirit connection rather than actually attending to you all and taking your questions. So it's at times like that that the grounding rock becomes um, really useful for me as well. And you know, it's just, it's a, even though it came from the water, it's just representative and also not just representative, but an actual piece of the earth. So it's the element earth that is really helping to bring me back down to earth when I need to be back when I need to be brought back down to earth, right? So, yeah. But it isn't until I become aware that I'm channeling that I need to bring myself back down. That's that's when, when I'm not aware of the fact that I'm channeling and I'm just flowing with it, it's fine. But when I become aware of it, then I'm in danger of kind of like losing my train of thought and forgetting what the conversation was beforehand and then sort of just going off in another direction. And that's when this comes in handy to refocus me, ground me, bring me back to center, bring me back attentive to you again. Yeah, I'm not a huge crystal expert. So, um, the other question is maybe share some recommended crystals affiliated with grounding. I'm not a huge crystal expert. I do not work a lot with crystals. I work a lot with rocks. Um, <clears throat> in terms of like modern witchcraft, I think this is a little bit unusual. I don't see a lot of people who just work with rocks anymore. Um, in so far as what we've come to think of as modern witchcraft, but a lot of old school folk magicians, folk practitioners, they do work with rocks and, and did work with rocks. So 
that's something that I seem to be more connected to and that I was more connected to since a small child. I, I was working with rocks since I was really little. Um, I always had a collection of rocks. I had a divination system with rocks that I created, that I used when I was a child, that I used when I was a teenager. So rocks have always been something that I connect with and I haven't really learned a ton about crystals. Um, what I will say is that I like snowflake obsidian. It's not specifically for grounding, but it can be used for grounding in the way that it assists you with filtering out negativity. So for instance, if you're somebody who is really sensitive, if you're an empath or a super sensitive or clairsentient, and you're really sensitive to energy surrounding you or energy from people around you, then something like snowflake obsidian may be useful for assisting you with repelling that negativity and protecting yourself from the negativity. So that's something that's interesting about snowflake obsidian as well, because oftentimes rocks or minerals or crystals will be either good at vanishing or protecting, but not necessarily both. And snowflake obsidian, I find, is good for both. So that's gonna help you repel the energy that could distract you and that keep you grounded in that way. Hematite or hematite is another one that I really love for the same reasons. Very protective, love how that feels. Um, very much uh, assisting with repelling energies that can be distracting or repelling unwanted or negative energies. My necklace is carnelian, which is a kind of agate. And carnelian is wonderful for assisting with your throat chakra, assisting with public speaking, assisting with communicating, assisting with telling your truth, right? That's why I wear it sometimes when I do these live chats. So you can see that there's a lot of things I do to help my, myself communicate clearly, to help me connect with you, to help me get my ideas out, get my thoughts out to you in a clear way, help me to be grounded and present with you. I love your rock. I found a brown one like it when I was little. I gave it to my grandmother and she kept it for years as a paper weight. I'm drawn to, drawn to rocks. Yeah, me too. I love them. And I have some handy right here that I keep on the altar. And this one is a hagstone. There are other names for it as well. Holy stone, hagstone witch's stone, it, a hag stone or witch's stone is a stone that has a hole in the center of it. And there's a lot of them in Texas. They're very, very plentiful here. And this is a, an excellent stone for um, representing intuitive wisdom, um, nature wisdom, strong connection with the earth, but it's also really amazing for protection. This is one that I keep on my altar um, near my services or near my workings almost every time. These are always on my altar. And then this one is just a very round, almost oval, but very round stone here from Texas from um, one of my favorite nature spots that I used to go to a lot. And it has a lot of quartz in it. It has a lot of crystal in it. Um, and I just like it for its very like round and um, dense quality that it has. So if I really needed some heavy duty grounding, <laughs> then maybe I would use this one. But what I use these for mostly is for grounding and protecting my work, grounding and protecting my magic. Um, in folk magic, there's a lot of things that you can do with a simple rock, like hold something down hold someone or something down. Let's say that you wanted to hold down a job. You can use a rock and then something that symbolizes that job. Use the rock to hold it down. Let's say that you needed to bind someone. You needed to hold them back from doing something harmful. You could put this rock on top of their doll baby or their poppet. So there's a lot of ways that you can use rocks in folk magic. Um, and I like to use this one to hold down my work, right? So what I'm doing there is I'm holding down the power. I'm grounding the power. I'm um, centering the power. I'm 
keeping it in place, solidifying it, helping it to be solidified and helping it to be manifest on the earthly realm, in the physical realm, right? In that sense, this is, this is, um, in that sense of grounding, this is assisting with the manifestation in the physical everyday realm. And then the hagstone is on the other side of my work usually, and by work I mean my candle spells, and the hagstone is in that way used to protect my work, right? So to protect it from prying eyes, to protect it from interference, to protect it from reversing, to protect it from um, undoing, right? So... Rocks are very useful in folk magic, and I very much feel connected to them and aligned with them. I don't have any other rocks handy, and I think smoky quartz is good for grounding. It's mostly good for cleansing and clearing, and I'm mostly speaking about this intuitively because I'm not super studied on crystals. That's just not my forte. It's not my area of expertise. But I feel like smoky quartz, I'm looking over here because I have a smoky quartz point that was given to me as a gift. I have it near my ancestor altar. Um, smoky quartz, I think, can be helpful for grounding. But again, I think that it's more potent for cleansing and clearing. And so, you know, there's a lot of different elements that can be associated with grounding. Like you can be become ungrounded for a lot of different reasons. And examining that reason is going to, can help you decipher the cure or the remedy or the aid to assist you with the grounding. So you can become ungrounded because you are just bogged down by too much outside energy. Maybe you need a cleansing, maybe you need hearing smoky quartz can assist with that. I'm also looking around at some of my other rocks. Um, one of the other things that I do with rocks is I have rocks that are from gravestones, not from the actual stone itself, but from the grave. Although I do have a piece of rock from my husband's ancestor that was actually a crumbled off piece of the tombstone. And then, of course, that's on our ancestor altar to help to assist us with connecting with his ancestors. And then I have a rock that is, I have rocks that were given to me by nieces and nephews and I have them nearby my ancestor altar just to symbolize and assist with that connection to family, that familial connection and reminding me of the generations and reminding me that not only am I paying honor and homage to my ancestors, but I am also one day going to be a good ancestor and that's part of my job through my own spiritual evolution, right? So there's a lot of different ways that I use rocks and very few ways that I use crystals. <laughs> I'm gonna bring Spirit Chat to an end now. And I look forward to seeing those of you who are Mystic members today at 4 p.m. for our tarot party. I'll be providing some readings and some guidance. That should be a good time. We'll have a chance to hang out together. And then in two weeks, the first week in June, I look forward to seeing you all join to hang out with Brooke and I, Brooke from Nightbird Enchanted. So that should be super fun. Thanks for being here today. I really appreciate your questions. Great conversation. Much, much love and many blessings to all of you.